Hello, everyone. Uh, does anyone mind if I take a photo? Because I've always wanted to take a photo of the audience. Yeah. So if you can all wave and do stuff, that would be awesome. Wave more. Wait, oh, I don't know. I've never taken a selfie. Wave now. Perfect, thank you. Goodbye. All right, so my name is Daniel Pataki. I, um, I used to build a lot of things for WordPress, I still do, but uh, nowadays I mostly write about things. So um, you may know me from Smashing Magazine, where I'm an editor, uh, WPMU Dev, Tuts Plus, and various other magazines. Um, and today I'm going to talk about interacting with REST APIs within WordPress. So I'm not going to be talking about the, the WordPress REST API, but how to actually work with other APIs. Um, let me give you a quick example of what you can do. So this is something I built for uh, a company um, that were doing webinars. And webinars are online, you go and register, and then whenever the time comes, you go to a specific website and you can see everything live. And what they wanted was to be able to see the registrants within WordPress. So um, what we did in the end, there's a meta box up top over there, and you just enter the ID of the webinar, and once you press enter, um, WordPress, the, the theme or the plugin communicates with GoToWebinar, pulls in all the registrant data, and just fills that table. I've changed the names in the emails, by the way. Um, and th there are lots of other cool things you can do. So other stuff that we've built in only by actually inputting that one ID is to pull in all the registration questions from GoToWebinar. So we actually have a front-end form. No one ever sees the GoToWebinar back-end or front-end. So to get this done, we, know, we have to know what a REST API is. Um, I won't go into super technical details. The, the goal of this presentation is basically to give you a hands-on approach of how you can actually start doing this because uh, what tripped me up in the beginning was that I could understand each API, but I couldn't really work with it out because I didn't understand what curl is and things like that back then. Um, so uh, an, so Re a REST API is essentially an application programming interface. REST stands for representational state transfer, but it's not important. And it's based on the HTTP protocol. So it uses resources and it uses HTTP verbs. This will become clear very soon um, because I will give you a no-nonsense example. So what happens when you make a request to any website, even in your browser, your browser is an HTTP client. So what happens is it can send a GET request to any website, like for example, mywebsite.com slash users slash one. And that will probably give you the details of the user with the ID of one. And the cool thing with HTTP is you can send different types of requests. Like you can send a PUT request to the same URL, a URL being the resource, the PUT being the HTTP verb. And this would actually update the user if you add specific other data to it. You can also send a delete request to the same URI, which will delete the user. And this is super easy because it's super obvious. You know what's going to happen from the HTTP <coughs> verb and from the resource that is identified. Now, the problem with this was, so this is what you get in many API documentations. And this is super clear, but you don't really know what to do with it in your code. So to, um, to give you a quick actual example, this is an actual thing that you would do with Twitter. So you would send a get request to that URL. And as you can see, there's a specific JSON file, user timeline.json. And then there are two parameters, screen name and count. Screen name will identify the user that you want to retrieve tweets from, and count identifies the number of tweets that you need. And then Twitter spits back a JSON encoded string, and it has loads of data about these tweets. Like for example, you can see how many times it was retweeted. You can see the tweet text. And you can just use PHP code to convert this to an array and then display it on your website. So to get started with REST APIs, any REST API, really what you need is a little bit of HTTP know-how, an API documentation, and a way to make HTTP calls and grab responses. Uh, so I thought I'd go through all three of these. And I think the HTTP know-how is especially useful. Once I realized how HTTP works, which is basically the basis of the web, everything became a lot clearer to me. So HTTP is a client-server network protocol. And what this means is base, very basically, a client, which is usually your browser in an everyday situation, it sends a, res, a request to a server, and the server responds to that request. So basically, you know, get me google.com. So you send a request to google.com. Google.com spits back a lot of info and then displays it. Um, and each message that you send, so a message would be either a request or a response. Each of these messages has four parts. Um, it has an initial line, a, header, a few header lines, which are mostly optional, a blank line, and a body. And if you go through all four of these, well, the blank line is pretty obvious, but if you go through the other three, um, you suddenly understand a lot more. So um, when you send a request, 
um, you're actually sending three bits of data. The three bits of data that you're sending is an HTTP verb, which defines what type of action you want to take on the resource that you're going to. The second part is the path to the resource, which could be something like slash post slash 331, which would be the post with the ID of 331. And the last part is the HTTP version, which is usually 1.0 or 1.1. Um, the main part here is that you're sending an HTTP verb and a path. When you get a response back, um, you're getting three bits of data as well. Um, the HTTP version, which usually matches the one you've sent, um, and then you get a status code and a reason phrase. And these may be um, familiar to you. This is where you get 404 not founds, 301, 302 redirects, 500 server errors. And um, this is where actually these codes come from. So this is the originating point of whenever you see you know, 404 not found, this is where it comes from, from the response of the, um, of the server. Now the next part of the four was HTTP headers. And these are very simple key value pairs that contain additional information about the request of the response. Uh, HTTP 1.1 defines 46 of these headers. You don't really have to get scared because uh, only one is required. And you usually use like two, three, four others. Um, some examples would be, the most important one is the third one, which is why I made it the third. Um, the host, which is required. And that actually contains the beginning of the URL that you're going to. So um, in the beginning, in the initial line, you just have the path to the resource, which comes right after the base domain name. So if you would go to a Smashing Magazine post, your host header would be smashingmagazine.com, and then the initial line of your request would contain slash post slash 331. Um, there are also others, like which language you accept or authentication. That will be really important when you're actually working with an API like Twitter. We'll go get into that soon. And the message body is really what everyone's familiar with, even if you haven't really looked at HTTP. This is what contains the good stuff, like the content of the, of the website, or any error messages, additional stuff. Or if you're communicating with Twitter, you might get the JSON encoded string back in the message body. So this is really what we're actually after when we're using a REST API. We want to grab the, the message body and then use it in some way. So after all that, what, what is actually the difference between HTTP and REST because it seems a bit intermingled? And the reason for that is because it is. Um, HTTP is a network protocol. So that's basically how the internet works and is built. Um, REST is an architectural framework that actually uses HTTP as its foundation. It's kind of similar to how WordPress isn't PHP and PHP isn't WordPress. So PHP is the core language and WordPress is built in PHP and it uses it as, it founda as its foundation. And the easiest way to describe how they are separated is, um, is you as a developer when you're making a REST API. So the people who are actually coding the WordPress REST API, they get to decide what happens when the server gets an HTTP request. So just because you send a delete request to Sasha Magazine slash post slash 331, you obviously will not delete that post. So um, there are authentications involved in there. There are other checks and balances. And obviously, an application developer can actually decide if they want to actually make that available at all to anyone. So the second bit is how to actually, once we now know HTTP, how do we actually use it to make requests? Uh, there are lots of ways. You can use a terminal, you can use curl, and you can use a bunch of other things. But WordPress has an HTTP API, which is awesome. So we should use that. And it's a unified interface for interactions with HTTP. You don't need to worry about all the underlying stuff. You just need to figure out a few basic functions like WP remote get, which will give you a get request. WP remote post will send a post request. And functions like WP remote retrieve body will retrieve the body of that request. And there are a bunch of other functions, but I think you get the idea of how this works. So an anatomy of a request is, um, in the first line there, you can see that I've used the WP remote get function, um, which has two parameters. You give it a URL, which is the resource you want to interact with. For example, smashing magazine slash post slash 331. And then you have a bunch of arguments. And the arguments could contain things like timeouts, redirections, and so on. But the two that you will most likely use is the headers argument, or the headers parameter, and the, um, and the body. And the header uh, part is where you would give those key value pairs, and then the body is where you might send some data or receive some data back. Now, putting this actually all together and actually creating something. So let's make a plan to retrieve some tweets from Twitter. Um, what we'll need to do is make a request to the Twitter API. We want to ask Twitter for tweets from whoever, for example, me or from a Twitter official account. 
Um, once that's happened, you use the WordPress functions, you can read the response of that. So we're going to need the body of the response, which will contain all the information about these tweets. Next, we're going to need to process the data. Uh, the data that you receive will most likely be a JSON encoded string. So what you would need to do at the bare minimum probably is a JSON decoded, which will make it an array. And you might want to filter out some stuff out of it or just grab some specific information. Um, and then once you have that, you would display it with PHP, HTML, and CSS like you generally do. Create a for each loop, um, create some HTML tags, and then just use CSS to style it all. Um, so the first part of this is creating a request. It's a good idea to visit the API documentation first, which is that link at the top, and that will tell you what you need to do. So the next part of this is when I'm telling you these are the parameters you need to use. I don't know this by magic. I go to the documentation and read it, and it kind of tells you what you need to do. So there is a resource URI that you need to use, which is explained in the documentation. And the documentation also defines some parameters, like screen name, which tells you who the tweet is from, like count how many. Uh, trim users is one for trimming out users, uh, not very uh, surprising. That means that for every tweet that you retrieve, you also get a lot of user data. But since we're just looking uh, for tweets from one user, we really don't need that data, so we can just trim it out. Um, you could exclude replies, and there are a few others. And then we need some headers. And the primary header that we need is an authentication header, which I will get to a bit later. Move on, there we go. So this is what an actual request code would look like. I have bad eyesight, so I'll just stand here. Um, the, I just used the WP remote get function, and I actually only added two parameters. The first parameter is the two lines below, uh, which is the URL. So that contains the, the resource URL plus some parameters added on, the screen name and the count. And then the second parameter contains an array of data that will, give, that will allow me to, um, to add lots of other things to the request. And there are two things I need, two headers. Now, the first header is an authorization header, um, which is a bearer token from uh, Twitter. That sounds a bit scary, but you're going to understand that very soon if you don't now, because we're going to look at authentication separately. Um, but that's just the string that you need to give. And then there's that long, long content type. Again, that's copy-pasted from the Twitter website. It can it, there's no special knowledge needed. And once that's done, I've just used the WP remote retrieve body function to read the body of that response. And then I use the JSON decode function just to grab the array from it. Once that's done, our tweets variable will contain an array of tweets. And if you print that out, I like to var dump out these things so I can just see all the elements in an array and just figure out what's needed. And this is just a very simple implementation where I just created the div, added a tweet text, and then the retweet count. Um, technically, you can't do this because Twitter doesn't allow you. They have strict visual guidelines. But, or rather technically, you can do it, but Twitter doesn't really let you. Um, so it should look like something like this at the end. I created this uh, plugin. It's called Twitter User Timelines. It's free in the repository. And basically, it's a showcase for all this. So if you want to take a look at how that, the code is done there, you should. Um, and basically, it displays it like this. But it has plenty of hooks, so you can change how it looks, but you shouldn't. Um, the, um, the next part is the, so the, the two things that tripped me up when I was working with this was that I didn't really know how requests and responses worked. So once I got that down, I was okay with that part. And then came out authentication, especially OAuth, where I was like, what the? And I, I actually solved that by drudging through Twitter's um, documentation back then, because it's actually not that difficult. So what happens is, in authentication, this, uh, the example I'm going to show you is from Twitter's um, application, or so I can't remember what the name is, but it's an application level authentication. Um, it's very similar to OAuth, and all of these systems use a kind of similar way of authenticating. So it's a two-step process. What you do is you send Twitter a consumer key and a consumer secret. These are generated for you, so when you create a Twitter application, you'll have this. And what you need to do is you need to send them a post request um, with this data in it. You will receive a response, and that response will contain another token. And this token is essentially used as a password. So instead of using your actual Twitter password, which would be stupid, uh, you just use a consumer key and consumer secret. You receive a temporary key, and you just use that to authenticate each further request. So it's not super, super difficult once you've actually done it once. So here's the actual process. And again, this is described on the Twitter website, so you can follow along. 
The problem with following along is that it is very error prone. So if you, if you add in a dot or if you add in a quote in the wrong place, it won't work like most PHP code. Um, so the first step is to URL encode the consumer key and secret. That will not change because it doesn't have any special characters to URL encode, but they still require you to do that because um, later on their keys and secrets might have special characters. <coughs> then you concatenate them using a colon, so it will just be the same thing with a colon in the middle. You then base64 encode the whole string, and this is what you need to send to Twitter in the next step. Twitter also gives you about four things that you need to send with your request. So your request must be an HTTP POST request, so that's number one, it needs to be a POST request. It also needs to go to slash OAuth slash token, that's the path that you need to take, that's two. This will be like six in the end. Um, the request must include an authorization header with the value of that base64 encoded value from step one. And you should not disregard that basic thing because that's needed. So the string that you need to send is actually basic, space, and that string that we made earlier. Uh, that's number three now. The request must include a content type header with the value of whatever that is, and the body of the request must be grant type client credentials. Again, I don't know what that is, but you can paste it in. It's not very difficult. <laughs> so um, here's what the response would look like and the request would look like. Um, you send the post request, that was number one and you just uh, tack on OAuth2 slash token at the end, that was number two. Those are the two headers that you can see, authorization and content type. Again, simple key value stuff. Then it's basic space and that thing which I truncated a bit so it fits. Um, and then there's another parameter that you use which is body and you just copy paste that grant type client credentials thing. Uh, and then in the same way, you use WP remote retrieve body and you use JSON decode to create an array. And the array will look like this. It will contain a token type and the scream, apparently. Um, and that's what you will need to use to authenticate yourself later, or you just scream at the computer, probably. Um, so here's what an authorized API call would look like. This is the same code that we used earlier. So if you want to get someone's tweets, you would use that uh, URL, and you would use this authorization bearer space and scream thing and then the content type, and you would get all the tweets back. So it's not super, super difficult. Um, it, it actually, all learning, in, for me at least, it starts with copy-pasting stuff, not being able to do it, and then copy-pasting it better. And then if you do that a few times, you'll understand it. Uh, the next part which tripped me up a bit was, fair enough, I now have an authentication token. I can, I can now authenticate all I want, but how do I actually do this the next time I want to retrieve someone's tweets? What if I want to retrieve three people's tweets in the same page load? Do I need to authenticate myself each time? And of course the answer is no. You can, but it's, you shouldn't. Um, it's a waste of resources and you know, it's a waste of time and money for everyone. So what you would need to do is, once you've authenticated yourself once, just store this token because this token will be valid for, an, for a number of seconds, something like, I, I don't know how much, but it's, it's definitely more than a few hours. And uh, that means that you, if you need to store something and it has an expiration date, that means it's a transient. And a transient is a value stored in the database or somewhere else that has an expiration value. So, and that's as easy as, um, as those two lines actually. So we ha when we have the bearer token and we JSON decoded the thing, um, all we use is set transient. You give it a name that you can choose whatever you want there, just make it unique. And then you add the bearer token and the expiration time in seconds. So now you have that stored in the database and it will time out after a while. So now with that in mind, we need to rewrite our code a tiny bit to make it work effectively. Um, what you need to do is create functions for the specific tasks and before you authenticate yourself, instead of always using uh, procedural code, you can use a variable which contains your bearer token and you would use either a transient, if it exists, to populate the value of that token, or if it doesn't, just create the transient by, um, by grabbing and authenticating yourself again. So, oh, that's a bit small, sorry. Uh, the way it works is actually, you have a get bearer token function, and what that does is what we've just done. So we authenticate ourselves, but at the end, instead of getting someone's tweets, we just set a transient value. Next, when you want to get someone else's tweets, what you do is instead of authenticating yourself, you check whether or not you have a transient present. So you get that same transient, and then you check if it's empty. You could do this a bit more effectively, but if it's empty, that means that you either haven't ever authenticated yourself, 
or that you have authenticated yourself, but the transient has reached its expiration value, which means that it will empty itself. Um, so then all you need to do is, if it's empty, just grab the bearer token again. Just use the get bearer token function, because the get bearer token function will also set the transient to make sure your bearer token is in the database, and it will also return it so you can use it right away. And then you just authenticate yourself and grab the tweets again. So um, in conclusion, use, when you use the REST API, it's not as difficult and scary as it sounds. Um, first, you authorize yourself and cache a token. You then build a request, usually using that cached token as your authentication uh, method. Um, you parse the response that you get. You cache the response if possible as well. That's a pretty important one as well. So if you've grabbed someone's tweets, like for example mine, don't grab them all the time on each page load because my, I don't tweet every millisecond. So you can just cache that whole response and just give it a timeout of an hour. I don't even tweet every hour, so you can just give it a, a transient of like a week. And, <laughs> and then, then, you, then you will just use that value in the database so you won't be communicating with Twitter. It will be really quick. So you use the retrieve data, and basically that's it. And also for a lot of REST APIs, like I think um, MailChimp has one, MadMimi has one, Twitter has one, GoToWebinar has one, they have client libraries available as well. So if you go on GitHub or if you just search on their website, they'll have pre-made stuff for you. So you don't need to write all this code yourself. Um, in some cases, I, if you've never done it before, I do recommend writing some yourself because it will help you learn how it works. But after that, you can use client libraries. And um, you can also help a lot of client libraries because what they usually do, they don't really keep up with all the API changes. So there may be some functions missing. And you can even help out by writing some of those functions. All right, so I hope that was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me now or you can get to me via email or Twitter or whichever one you want. And of course, here are the promised pictures of my dog, which I've just added. My dog is cute. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Drop me an email then. Your presentation was too good. It, yeah, they're nuts. I answered every question. Thank you. <laughs>